I'm a different bit, there's a lot of things here today. Um, I'm also nice and blue. I'm going to talk for a few minutes about things that I spent most of yesterday, most of yesterday evening, and some of this morning not doing at all. Uh, um, specifically, stuff that started out with looking at climate change. Uh, there's an interesting model that's out there that the government's published which says we think that the climate will change about this much over the next few decades. So you should allow for this much change in various environmental parameters over the next few decades. It's having things like developers who are going to look at a river and go, well, in 20 years it's going to be 33% more water coming through here. And what we thought was, can we take the existing flood risk maps and say, well, what if those situations actually come true? What happens to the risk of flooding? So we sat and thought about this and then thought, well, if it's just a straight function of how much water is running through a river, or rainfall, for example, yes, it's dead easy. The maps are based on risk. All we do is multiply the risk based on the government factors, and then you get big red areas where it's sort of more dangerous to be. But it turns out, unsurprisingly, that's not how flooding actually works. It's got loads of different things which all pile into building a reliable flood model. So then I thought, well, can we, using the sensors that we've got out there and historical records of what flooding actually happened, try and come up with a very rough and ready model into which we can plug new variables and see what happens. So, What's actually going to get wet if we make it three degrees warmer in 2015 and breathe up the whole year based on sensory inputs? This is using big machine learning type neural networks and insane amounts of maths that I'll be honest, I just sort of handed off to Google prediction APIs and said, tell me what you think. So I did a quick proof of concepts that yes, you can train a neural network that more or less takes a set of inputs on temperature, rainfall, river height, and tells you, is any given area of land going to get wet? Brilliant. Let's find some historical flooding data. Well, we've got a bit that tells us the Norfolk Broads flooded in 1972, and we've got a bit that tells us this lake here, you know, burst its banks in 1927, and there's absolutely nothing in between. There's massive inconsistencies in this, and the data that is there is a very binary shape file. It basically goes, this bit of land flooded or not flooded. And there's no distinction between you're going to get your ankles wet and you're going to get your nipples wet. This is not much use to anybody when trying to build predictive models based on hard data. So I have a quick think about how can we solve this. And the answer lies in some of the other things we're going to care about, which is the flood network and the things network. Namely, if we have lots more sensors measuring rainfall, temperature, river level, and lots more sensors measuring things like, is this bit of ground I'm standing on actually wet, and to what degree, we can train a big neural network, which can then reliably say if a given square of land is going to get wet or not, based on sensor inputs, without the need for anybody in the environment agency to find you the model. The other benefit being, when a bit of land does get wet, the model will in fact teach itself exactly what set of circumstances cause the wetness. So that's what I spent yesterday and this morning not doing. Uh, any questions? <laughs> uh, any questions? <laughs> the historic data set you were using, was it? The historic flood map? Yeah, um, well, the as many as I could find, um, they are basically just a set of shape files with a date saying the flooding happened in this area on this date. Um, as I said, what it doesn't say is the severity of the flood, how long the flood actually lasted for. Um, and there's often a mismatch between when there's data available for flooding and when there's data available that we could use to figure out what caused the flooding. So when we go back, um, especially more than two or three years ago, the only weather data that's readily available is monthly temperature averages and monthly rainfall averages, which isn't actually that much use at all because flooding doesn't happen on monthly scales, it happens on days. Yeah, yeah. Um, the other thing is on the depth, um, obviously it's that didn't at the edge. Yes. So, you know, you've got some like, LIDAR data set, I'll tell you how deep it was in the middle. 
1. In theory, yes. Um, but I was talking to some of the environment agency guys yesterday, and they said they have to do quite a lot of fine-tuning fine of their models um, based on things like ground flow and absorbency because water, although on a small scale, it, yes, it does self level perfectly, on a larger scale, it actually doesn't because it seeps into the ground and takes time to get from A to B. Fantastic, that's brilliant, man. Right? That's really good. Yeah. You really worth how far you've got. You're worth how you continue with the conversation. So, more data, big neural network, accurate flood prediction, no yeah. effort. Yeah. And, um, Ian will give you three Amazon credits for yeah. a short period to do it. Big data country. Why flood sensors? Why flood sensors? More flood sensors. <laughs> more wet flood sensors. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Ian over there, this is why consultancy will be dead in. Yeah, the more, 